Welcome to another edition of Rap Life Sports. Today, we have a legend in the business. We have Chris Broussard from Fox Sports 1. Also, he, he's been on Undisputed with uh, Shannon Sharp and uh, Chris Bayless, I mean, uh, Skip Bayless. He's also uh, has his own radio show, The Odd uh, Couple with Rob Parker. Chris, thank you for coming on the show today and blessing us with your presence. Nah, it's great to be on, man. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, definitely. And from my end, you know, you're a legend to me, somebody I've always looked up to. Uh, you're the Michael Jordan of what you do. You know Thank what I mean? You, I definitely want to, you know, give you your roses while you're here. You're definitely. Appreciate so maybe by five years, we'll have a doc series about, you know, showing what you do behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> nah, yeah. That's love, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. I, I, I really, you know, I think that's really important because a lot of, you know, people from our culture don't understand that there's, there's other ways to be in sports and still have a, a powerful impact in sports and not necessarily be the, you know, be that NBA player, be that NFL player, and you can still have a career in sports. And, you know, I don't think a lot of, a lot of people in general understand that that's, that's even possible. So that's why I say and, you're the Jordan of that because you're, you're the example for that. When I speak to, to youth, or, you mm -hmm. know, college students, high school, particularly high school and under, mm -hmm. I'm always telling them, especially African-Americans, that, you know, I was like most of our young boys. I wanted to play professional sports. I wanted to be a pro football player, or a pro basketball player, and I didn't make it. And the fact is, most of us won't make it. But right. you can still have a career, a very rewarding uh, and you know, productive career in sports, even if you don't make it as an athlete. So whether it's a broadcaster, a, an agent, a nutritionist, a trainer, a coach, a photographer, a videographer, a writer, uh, a mar sports marketing, public relations, like you can go on and on. There are so many jobs that you can have in sports and be around the games. You know, I've traveled the world, not just the country, the right. world covering basketball. You know, and so uh, you can do a lot of great things uh, and have a great career in sports, even if you don't make it as an athlete. But to do most of that, you're going to need the education. So that's why I tell kids, get that education. You know, unless you're a superstar athlete, like a mm -hmm. Charles Barkley or something, where, you know, you, you get it based on your, your playing career, most people are going to try need to get it through their education. So... That's uh, very important what you brought up, and that's something that we definitely want to – and I do think the word is getting out as, as young African-American boys and, and girls see more blacks uh, doing this job on ESPN, on Fox Sports 1, uh, writing you know, for various newspapers or, or websites. I think they are starting to realize, uh, hey, this is a career option that I can have that maybe – 20 to 30 years ago, I, I don't know how many African-Americans really even looked at something like this as something we could do. Right. With staying on lines of, you know, with college and going into college, um, how do you feel about, you know, college players, you know, being paid? And if you think they should be paid, do you think everybody should, you know, be it should be one flat rate across the starting quarterback getting the same as the backup lacrosse player? I think that obviously is a very complicated uh, topic. I definitely think they should get some pay. Uh, there's no question about that. And honestly, I, I think it should be the football and basketball players, males. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not into the whole, oh, well, what are we going to do with the lacrosse team? Or what are we going to do with the women's rowing team? No. The only sports that are generating money are the football and the basketball on the men's side for the most part. So that's who should get paid. Um, and so I think that is one thing I'll say about it. I, I think a good start is where they're, where they're at right now, where players are going to be able to capitalize on their marketing, on their likeness, their image and likeness. So, you know, if, uh, if, uh, if that even spreads it out where, let's say a female basketball player, like when you have Brittany Griner, who mm -hmm. was Duncan, she right. may have been able to get an endorsement opportunity where she could have made money, even though the sport of women's basketball may not make money. 
So yeah. I think that's fair. Maybe if you have a great golfer who, you know, people know about and she's a prodigy or he's a prodigy and Nike or somebody else wants to sign them, that's fair, you know? And so I, I think this is a good start. I don't know if it's the final answer or if it's the end all in that regard, but I think it's a good start. Zion obviously would have been able to make money on that last year. Uh, and, and that's fair because, you know, the the seventh man on the team who doesn't play a lot or if at all and people mm. don't know about him, he maybe he doesn't get paid, you know, and maybe he is more of a student athlete. And so uh, I think a good start is now and we'll see how that works out because it is a complicated issue as far as, you know, do you play the, the 51st guy on the football team? Right. You know, and is he making as much as the other guy? So I, I just think allowing individual players at this point to capitalize off their likeness is is good. And then get rid of some of the the rules that just don't make sense nowadays, you know, stuff like that. Um, and I think those are definitely steps in the right direction. Um, so, yeah, I think that's that's a big step where they should go. Let me ask you a question uh, with, with keeping in line with what uh, uh, Sahara just asked you. Do you do you believe personally that uh, once everyone is able to get paid off their likeness? Right. I know like right now it's in California and it's trying to trend across uh, the um, United States. Do you think once that's, you know, in the SEC, the ACC and everywhere, do you think that will cut down on some of the, you know, underground? Yeah. Probably not. It might cut down on a small degree, but it's probably still going to be there to a, a certain level or a certain extent, which is unfortunate. But I think, you know, there's corruption in, in virtually everything. And right. so you still may have some people that that try to to do those things and even think about it. Everybody's not going to get the huge deal uh, and certainly not national deal. Now, I think what what a good number of athletes will get are local deals. Okay. And, you know, you boosters could could pay some of the local dealerships, car dealerships, whatever it may be. Yes. So you can pay this guy a little more. So there may be stuff like that, but that's kind of capitalism, you know? And so yeah. um, I think it will definitely be more honest than what we have, you know, what we've had in the past. So, like I said, I think it's a step in the right direction, and it needs to go, to your point, national. And um, it should be the case for all college athletes. And, again, that helps even the – you can't say that's unfair because even athletes in some of the less popular sports mm -hmm. be able to benefit off things like that. Right. You know, if I was – when I was in school, if I was a prodigy – uh, if I was a an engineering prodigy and a company wanted to hire me, and I'm not an athlete, they wanted to hire me and pay me, that wouldn't have to interrupt my college, you know, studies. Right. Or if other athlete, if other students can get paid off of their abilities, uh, why can't athletes? I agree. Well, you know, the, you, with the times that we're in right now, everything, COVID, so on and so forth, how do you feel like what's what's the best way to move forward? Do you feel that we should just wait and kind of see what the NBA does with this whole bubble situation and just kind of let it play out that way? Or how do you just feel just with sports moving forward? Like as far as should they start? Yeah, should they start? Should they not start? Or just Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're doing the right thing. It's fine to give it a try, you know, um, as long as they're going to be responsible about it. You know, I think the NBA has – done a good job of putting something in place that's healthy and safe for the players. Uh, that's what all the doctors have said that, you know, they, they've kind of done a really excellent job with the bubble. Um, and if it doesn't work out and too many players come down with it, then I wouldn't blame the NBA. It was kind of like, there's just nothing you could do. And the NBA is fighting that same battle 
that the rest of the economy economy is fighting, and that is how do you balance it between the need for money in the economy mm -hmm. and the need for safety and health? Because whether it's the owners or the players, make no mistake, the number one driving force for this is money. Right. So obviously, a guy like a LeBron James and and the L.A. Clippers and these teams that have a shot to win a championship, they really want to play. They want closure to the season, and they want a title. And LeBron certainly wants another chance to win a title, especially at his age. But the the money aspect is huge uh, in that owners want to get that television money so the profits for this season don't plummet completely. And the players understand that if they don't play, then next year's salary cap will really drop dramatically. It's going to oh, wow. drop, obviously, regardless. But it could drop dramatically, and that could affect their salaries going forward for the next several years. So all of them are motivated by money. Um, and as long as there's a balance there with health, then I think um, give it a shot. And, you know, if it doesn't work out, so be it. I saw this morning that they, um, I think the voting will will be done for, you know, rookie of the year and um, um, MVP and all those things. So they really don't have a chance to try to add add to that. Yeah, because it's only fair because eight of the teams aren't playing. So what if a rookie of the year candidate was on one of those eight teams, you know what I right. mean? Or any of the other awards. So who who do you have who do you have right now, far as um, being the uh, NBA's MVP? I got Giannis Antetokounmpo. Um, okay. I think it's pretty cut and dry. Obviously, LeBron is number two. He's had a great season, but you don't grade on a curve. Mm. You know, er everybody throws into the argument for LeBron in his seventeenth season. <laughs> wow. Okay, that's not a part of the equation. <laughs> you know, uh, that that doesn't matter. And so um, he's having a great year. But the things that helped LeBron win the MVP when he was in Cleveland, when they won 66 games and 60 uh -huh. games, Giannis is doing the same exact thing. He's the only superstar on his team. He's leading them to the best record in the conference, if not the league. Uh -huh. um, he, you know, his numbers are incredible. He's doing it on both sides of the floor. And one of the criteria that I use, one of them, is what, what help you have. Who's, who, who else is on your team? Look at Shaq and Kobe. They, they have two MVPs combined because a lot of times they canceled each other out, unfortunately. Right. So when you have that type of superstar teammate, it can tend to work against you. Look historically. Like I said, when LeBron won his in Cleveland, when Derrick Rose won his in Chicago, those were large parts of the argument. They they did it by themselves. Well, now LeBron's got Anthony Davis. There's no Anthony Davis on the Bucks. You know, nothing even close. And Giannis obviously is doing it more on the defensive end than LeBron. His offensive numbers are better. Obviously, LeBron's got the assists, but outside of that, Giannis, you know, has him beat. Um, you know, the Bucks team is terrific on offense and defense, obviously because of Giannis. So there's really, uh, to me, it's, it's fairly cut and dry. And I believe from, from talking to different media members and, and polls and things I've seen mm -hmm. that Giannis is going to win it going away. Well, with, staying on with, you know, just in basketball in general or just any sports with, with the time that we're in, as black athletes, do you feel that, you know, should they make a stand or should they, you know, kind of follow up on the Ka Kaepernick type way with, with, the, with all the killings and things going on? Should they just stick to being athletes, play basketball and let the politicians and other people handle that type of scenarios? Now, I've always felt that our black athletes need to speak out and need to be about action to help our people, because I've said this before. I believe that black athletes have more power to force and create change in society than any other group of black people in America. And that includes politicians. I mean, you saw how 
Barack Obama's hands were tied even when he was president. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. and so and to me, what makes the black athletes so powerful is that number one, they are the wealthiest African Americans. You know, if you look in Forbes top ten list of wealthiest African Americans. Most of them made it through sports or entertainment. Right. And there's several athletes in there. I'm not saying every one of them has, but as a whole, yeah. they tend to make more money than any you know, other group of African Americans for the most part. Number two, they're very well connected to corporate America. You know, McDonald's wants you to endorse your product, Nike wants you, that gives you power, that gives you leverage. Oh, you want me to endorse your product? What are you doing for black people? What are you doing for the people in my community? You know, so that gives you power. Uh, and number three, they're the most beloved African Americans on the or black people on the planet. You know, right. white kids are growing up. White kids who may one day, who will likely one day, be in powerful positions mm -hmm. and impact African Americans through hirings, through laws. They, I grow up idolizing black athletes, you know, and as I said, back to the second point about being well connected, a lot of white power players in today's society want to be connected. They want, you know, they want to play golf with LeBron or, you know, they want to go out to dinner with Steph Curry or whoever it may be, have him talk to their kids. And, you know, Magic Johnson used to tell me when he played for the Lakers, all of these corporate titans wanted to, you know, meet with him and play golf with him or whatever. And he was like, look, if, if I do this with you, then you have to teach me business. It's right. going to be a two-way street. Let me pick your brain about business. And so that, that's what I mean by being connected. And then number four, they're irreplaceable. They are the most irreplaceable black people on earth. You know, you... You can find a, a white accountant or journalist to do, do something that a black person may do. Um, you can't find a, I haven't seen the white LeBron James <laughs> or Ezekiel Elliott or, you know, Patrick Mahomes. I mean, our, our, white, our black athletes, that's a skill set, number one, <clears throat> that most people just don't have. It's a very unique skill set where a lot of jobs are a lot of things that, that a lot of people can do. You know, right. if you're trained to do it, a lot of people can do most jobs. That's not true with sports. And so right. our athletes are wealthy, well-connected, beloved, and irreplaceable. That is great leverage to do yeah. what to do great things for the black community. And so I would love for our athletes to unite and create like an organization of African-American athletes where they use those advantages that I just mentioned to help the masses of black people, whether it's in provoking and promoting policy changes and legislation or um, even in the private sector. You know, for instance, I'm just off the top of my head. If you're an athlete and McDonald's wants you to endorse them, how, how about if you're that good, you know, every athlete doesn't have this leverage, but if you're mm -hmm. that good and you say, well, okay, you want me to endorse your, your product, how many of your franchises are owned by black people? 4%? Wow, we're 13% of the population. We got to get that up. So let's say put in my contract within five years, 8% of our owners are African American. Within seven years, it's up to... 11% within, you know, you can do things like that. Right. I would love to see an organization of African American athletes. So like what LeBron James is doing is terrific in Akron, but I would love to see other athletes do. We should have 50 athletes doing that. Exactly. You're going through his program. I promise if you graduate, you get a free college scholarship to the university of Akron. Right. We should have athletes in every, you know, the top athletes in their hometown or the city they play in, whatever it may be, doing the same thing with the local college there. You know, so LeBron can share the blueprint for them to do stuff like that. 
See, now speaking out is fine, and obviously guys are speaking out. But let's not get it twisted, and, and let's understand that speaking out in the 60s and early 70s was a lot bigger than it is today. Right. Ali and Jim Brown and Bill Russell and Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, when they spoke out, they were really risking something. Right. They were risking, you know, heck, in some cases, potentially right. your life, certainly your career. Whereas now we've progressed to the point where speaking out is fine, but we need action. Speaking out is not enough. Honestly, it doesn't take a lot of courage to cr criticize Trump. I mean, you're going to get praised by half the country for doing that. You know, okay. so, now I will say this. They are, uh, they do have more to lose in turn, not, not more to lose. Cause obviously, like I said, it was dangerous to do that in the sixties uh, with Tommy Smith and John Carlos and you know what they did. But Nowadays, athletes have their brands and they're connected to the endorsers, like I mentioned in corporate America. Back then, you didn't have those attachments. So no, not like Michael Jordan said in the 80s, Republicans buy sneakers too. Right. In the 60s, that wasn't even, nobody was even thinking about that. We're not endorsing products. It's, that's, not, that's not something we're tied to. So we don't have to put that on the line to speak out. Um, but I would say today the athletes make so much money that even if you did risk losing an endorsement, you're still making millions from your contract in a lot of cases. Uh, and I also think you need to be strategic about like which athletes. Colin Kaepernick, I thought, was more courageous because at the time he began kneeling, mm -hmm. he was the second stringer. He was expensive. Yeah. They could have cut him that season and nobody really would have thought twice about it. You know, they could have cut him before it even became a story because he was sitting down for like two weeks before it became a story. They could have said, what are you doing? Talk to him privately and cut him. And nobody would have thought it was for any political reason or anything. He was not, he was expendable at that point. Uh, whereas if he had done it, if a superstar does that, if a Russell Wilson, a Pat Mahomes, a LeBron James, a James Harden, if they kneel, you think they out of the league? <laughs> no. No. They probably start a trend. You know what I'm saying? So that's where, you know, I would advise, you know, if you're just a, a, a marginal athlete, uh, obviously you can speak out. You know, but be wise, you know. The Bible says be wise as a, as a serpent, humble as a dove, you know. So be wise about how you move. But I do think now is the time where our athletes, it needs to be more about action than just speaking. Speaking is important and good, but we right. need more than that. Let me ask you a question. Of, of, uh, I don't know if you've ever been asked this, so I hope I'm asking something you've never been asked before. But my question for you is, what was the moment or the break uh, that came for you that you felt like, like, okay, I'm in the game in this, in this sports journalist business? Well, I mean, I, I would say when I got hired, you know, by a mainstream you know, newspaper. Um, I, I had my, my big break was I had a summer internship at the Cleveland Plain Dealer the summer after my junior year of college. That was the biggest newspaper in Ohio. I believe it still is. And so I did well that summer in the internship. And toward the end of the year, this, the summer they told me they were going to hire me when I graduated. So that was really like, okay, wow. I mean, you can imagine going into your senior year of college, knowing you have a job when you graduate, a job that you'll enjoy, a job that you make good money at. So that would, I would say that was certainly when I felt like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a sports writer. I'm, I'm in the business. Now at that time, I mean, I started out answering telephones. You know, I didn't start out covering the pros. I ain't started out covering anything. I was in the in the office answering phones, doing 
the the transactional page and you know all that stuff editing and then uh, I started covering high schools I covered high schools for about three years three and a half years before I moved up to the pros and so um, you know that was that was the 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 journey and a lot of people don't see that they want to go straight wow. to the pros you know but it like Stephen A Smith I believe started out covering high schools um, you know, you got to work your way up. And the best way to get to the top level where you want to go is to excel where you're at. Right. So, you know, like you guys, if you're, mm -hmm. if you're, if one of you is obsessed or both of you were getting on ESPN and I, man, I can be up there with Stephen A. I should be up there. And if mm -hmm. you're so, that's good to have a goal, but right. if you're so focused on that, that you can't, you're not even putting all the effort into what you're doing now, you'll mm -hmm. never get there. But the best way for you to put, have a chance to get there one day is to excel where you're at. So mm -hmm. when I was covering high school sports, if I was so, man, I should be covering the pros. Oh, man, my boy, he already covering the, the Packers, and he's he my age. You know, why am I still sitting here covering high schools? And I'm not putting it all my all into the high school sports. Right. I'm never going to get to the pros. What I had to do was dominate my high school beat, write the best stories, break stories, you know, do do a great job covering high schools so that they would notice me and then I'd get promoted to the pros. And so that's what I did. So that's that's what I would say to anybody trying to get into the game. And look, it's hard. It's obviously a limited number of jobs. Sure. It's very intense competition. Um but you guys are taking the right step in that, like nowadays, you know, the internet has democratized things. Mm -hmm. When I was coming out of school, if you didn't get a job at a magazine, a newspaper, a radio station, or a television station, you were out. You weren't going to be in the media. It was just as simple as that. And you couldn't even produce clips to show people what you can do. Whereas now... You can create your own podcast, create your own website, create your own blog and write things and, and create clips and video clips that you can show people at, you know, the bigger mainstream networks, what what you can do uh, or even just build up your own. You know, you may even be able to build up a big following on your own and that can either help you go some to another network or. It can help you just build up your own thing and keep doing your own thing, but making money at it. So, um, you know, this is you guys are definitely doing the right thing in that, this regard. Well, we appreciate that. That's big coming from you, Chris. We appreciate that. And what I would say, add to it is you have to figure out a way, like, whether it's being unique or what is it? Because obviously a lot of people are doing this. So what yeah. is it about yours that's going to get you noticed? What is it about yours that sets you apart from everybody else that's doing a, a podcast or something like that? So yeah. those are things to think about. Like, remember the rappers when they used to sell the records out of their cars? Mm -hmm. Well, everybody wasn't going to make it that way. But a few that had something special about them or something unique about them, they were able to do it that way and turn it into a, a big career. So, you know, think about something like that. Uh, that's the plan. So you you know that that insight of what you're giving us that that's kind of what I feel like to set us apart. We we do you know it's rap life, sports, music, and health. So my brother's a doctor, so we got the insight of the doctor. You know to facilitate to the players and like Kawhi Leonard by you know having your own doctor, getting another doctor's opinion. So we you know definitely trying to bring it full circle and ask some questions that you, we just you know I watch sports all the time we just don't hear and you you how you giving us insight and giving the the younger generation insight on things that they can learn from so that's what we're trying to you know what would set us apart as opposed to you know debating about who's the greatest so on and so forth but we can have good genuine conversations with men that just us talking and the people watching that they can gain something from it and can learn from it so right. that's what you know trying to set us apart so appreciate that um, just a, my next question what what do you feel is the best era in sports is it the 90s is it now is it was it the 60s the 70s like what was the what's the best era 
in sports? Wow. That's a tough one. Um, I mean, because I think it differs for different sports. Obviously, boxing was the 70s. Yeah. You know, with Ali, Foreman, Frazier, you know. Um, and then, you know, even the 80s was good, too, because you had Sugar Ray Leonard, you know, Thomas Hearns, Marvin Hagler. Uh, Tyson was beginning to come up. And um, so I think boxing certainly was better back then. Uh, Because they fought each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, they fought each other. You know what I'm saying? Like, they didn't, it was no ducking and no waiting and no, you know, all that. So that was better. Uh, As far as basketball, I'll say this. The athletes, the the players today are more athletic than ever. True. I don't think that's even debatable. Their handles, their ball handling is better than ever. Mm-hmm. Some of it, some of it, not with everybody, but some of it because they let you carry. Let's just, I mean, <laughs> you, carry, you know, they carry uh, a lot of times. So their handles are better. They certainly shoot the three better. Yeah. Um, because obviously they practice it more. Although back then you did have a lot of really great three point shooters. Uh, Joe Dumars, uh, Chris Mullen, guys that shot like 38, 39% from three, but just didn't shoot it a lot, you know? And and also back then, I've had ex-players tell me that not only are guys shooting the three better today because they shoot it more and they practice it more, but you're encouraged to shoot it. Mm. Whereas back in the day, they're like, look, and I'm back in the day, I mean like the early 2000s. It was like, if you take a three, it better be a great shot. Right. Like, because if you take a three and you miss it, your coach, your teammates looking at you like, dude, what are you, what are you doing? doing? If you miss two threes in a row, they like throw the ball inside or move in, go to the mid range, or the coach is taking you out. Mm-hmm. So it was more of an apprehension. You didn't even have the freedom to just take threes at will like you do now, which obviously adds to your confidence and your, you know, comfort in shooting the shot. And so um, so I'll give them all of those advantages today. What they don't do as well, obviously there's, there's no post play hardly. There's very little post play. The offensive post players aren't, they don't have as, as many moves as the post players in the past. So they're not as good offensively in the post. They don't defend the post as well because they're not used to it. They never do it. Right. Uh, point guards, a lot of point guards don't make, don't really know how to make great entry, post entry passes. So there's all of that, you know. Um, they don't play five on five basketball as well. They don't play team basketball, getting all five players involved as well. And if you notice, the teams that do have mm-hmm. success. When San Antonio ran through Miami in 2014, they didn't have more talent necessarily. They were old. I mean, Duncan was at the end. Yeah. Parker and Ginobili were old. Kawhi was a pup, so he wasn't, wasn't fully where he's at. But they played five man basketball, mm-hmm. you know, and and the team basketball, which combined with talent and skill. Golden State, Draymond was a second round draft pick. Yep. Steph was at Davidson. You know, Clay Thompson was a low lottery pick. So if you lined up LeBron, Kyrie, Kevin Love, Steph, Clay, Durant. Or um, Draymond, I mean. You're going to pick this three all the time. Yeah. Kyrie and LeBron, right, on talent. But the what made Golden State the juggernaut before Durant mm-hmm. was that they played team basketball. They moved the ball. And that's so unique today that you can win a ton of games just playing like that. And some of it's the game has just changed because – you know, back when I played back in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, you came down as a point guard and you ran plays. Exactly. You came down, kicked it, ran through, cutting, you know, right. running the flex, whatever it might be. Everybody's moving. 
Whereas now everything is high pick and roll and drive and kick. So when you when everything is high pick and roll, I'm running high pick and roll, and all the other players are just spreading the floor. So if I don't have something coming off the pick, I can kick, I got somewhere to kick it, right? Right. That's not really, you're not learning team basketball. You're not learning how to move without the ball. You're not learning how to go set screens unless you're the pick man. And, you know, as the ball handler, you're not learning to pass and move and cut and things like that. And so it's not all the players. It's just the way the game has changed in that you got. So it's so much high pick and roll. And if it's not high pick and roll is what? Drive and kick. Mm -hmm. So if I drive and either I'm shooting or I kick it out, uh -huh. I have to know how to play five-man basketball. I really have to know how to play two-man basketball, you know, or three-man ball. So that's uh, – and I just think that the five-man ball is more effective. Of course. Because everybody in five-man basketball, generally, everybody's able to – if you got really good players, they're all able to kind of play to the top of their game. Whereas if it's high pick and roll and drive and kick and one or two players are dominating the ball and creating all the plays, then everybody else can't play to the top of their ability. You saw LeBron, as great as LeBron is and as unselfish he is, as he is, when he can't, he don't, three guys ain't going to excel with LeBron. It's only going to be two. You right. know, he was in Miami. He and Wade were able to get his. Bosh had to become a glorified role player because LeBron was going to create everything or Wade was going to create everything. And so Bosh had to just kind of stand out by the three-point line and wait for the shots. By the time they left, he was averaging 16 and six. You know, Kevin Love, same thing. So Kyrie could get his, LeBron could get his, but Love had to become a glorified role player. Mm -hmm. And learn how to shoot three, you know, hit threes and learn how to rebound from the perimeter. And so that's the difference. Whereas you look at Showtime, Magic, <laughs> get his, Magic could be at the top of his game. Kareem could play to the top of his game. Worthy could play to the top of his game. Byron Scott could play to the top of his game. You look at the Celtics, Bird could do his thing. Uh, McHale, Parrish, everybody was eating. Yeah, you know, and that's the difference in that. And even in Golden State, when Durant went there yep. and for the most part fit in, you know, it was a little pushback toward the end of him wanting to be ISO and all that. But for the most part, Steph, Durant, and Clay, they all was getting theirs. And Draymond could do what he does, you know. So, team five man team basketball, I think, is going to beat, you know, Two man, one or two man basketball, um, where one guy's kind of creating everything. I actually think that with LeBron, it's similar to Wilt Chamberlain. Like, Wilt Chamberlain is arguably the greatest player ever, ever to play. Mm -hmm. So, you don't hear him in the arguments because he didn't win enough. But why didn't he win enough? Because Wilt was a one man show for the most part, where Wilt went. And play everything went through Wilt. But notice the two years he won championships, that wasn't the case. The first year he won a championship, it was the lowest, it was like his eighth, seventh, or eighth year. It was the lowest scoring average he had ever had in his career. It was 24 points a game because he was playing more team ball. Oh. And they won. And then the second year he won his championship, he only averaged 14. And it wasn't like he could still couldn't ball anymore. He was he averaged like 19 rebounds. He averaged a good number of assists. His shooting percentage was still high. He just wasn't shooting as much because he was blending in with the team. And Jerry West and Gail Goodrich were the leading scorers. But team ball, he didn't win it when he was averaging 50 and 44 and 38 and all that. And even Jordan, when he was a one-man show in Chicago, 30, 37 a game, 32, 8 and 8, 35. You know, he didn't win it those years. As great as he was, he won it when he when they the triangle came. And now we're playing team ball. You still the man, 
but everybody's touching it. Everybody's moving. Watch Jordan. He did not dominate the basketball. Like LeBron, Steve Nash, Chris Paul, Dwayne Wade, all, all the, most of the stars today. Most, not all. But they over-dribble. Yeah. That takes away from, if one dude dribbling for 15 seconds, 20 seconds, that's taken away from the team, the movement. You know, Jordan was, he shot a lot. Right. Sure. So people get it twisted. Oh, he, Jordan shot 27 times a, a game one year, 24 times. He shot a lot. But he didn't over dribble. Mm-hmm. There were many possessions you come down, he don't even touch the rock. Or if he when he gets it, two dribbles. Bang. Go up, right? Or I ain't got nothing. I'm moving it. You know, a couple three dribbles. BJ Armstrong once told me, he said, Michael learned how to dominate the game in three dribbles or less. Wow. And what that does is everybody else gets their touches. So when it's time for me to shoot, I'm in rhythm because I'm 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 involved. I'm active. And mentally, I'm feeling like I'm more a part of it. Mm -hmm. And LeBron, as great as he is, and obviously he's very unselfish. Right. LeBron's like becomes a one man show. It's like it's I I say there's systems. There's, you know, the, the, the high pick and roll. There's flex. There's motion. There's Princeton offense. There there's the LeBron. (laughs) <laughs> you know, <laughs> he because he becomes the offense. Meaning, he creates all the offense. You know, I mean, even before he was playing points, 60, 70 percent of the time, he's bringing the ball up, and so he's creating everything. If he sco- he's, he he sh- scores, or he kicks it to the guy that shoots and scores, or he gets the hockey assist, but everything is created through him, and that shows how great he is. And that enables him to lift any team. One thing he has over Jordan, I think LeBron could lift, like LeBron could do more with less. Like LeBron could take a lesser team and make them great uh, to an extent that I don't think Jordan even could. But there's a limit in that because what who's been LeBron's nemesis, nemesis throughout his career? San Antonio. Why? They play team ball. So now you got one team where one guy's creating everything, you know, not that he's shooting all the time, but he's creating it, you know, and the other team where it's everybody's getting involved is moving. And who else was a nemesis? Golden State. Golden State. You know, so that's so LeBron individually is, I mean, obviously phenomenal and 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 great. But I think I always say, had he got had a Popovich, a Phil mm-hmm. Jackson, maybe even a Pat Riley, gotten a LeBron early in his career, and gotten him like, look, we gonna you gonna fit into the system rather than be the system. I think LeBron would have more championships. Look at Kawhi, and I think Kawhi is gonna win this third this year. I think the Clippers gonna win it. Kawhi ain't the system. Nope. Why it just fits in. And that's why it's easy. That's why Toronto, he could miss 22 games. And then when he came back, it was like nothing. He was never gone because he's just dropping into the system. Same thing with the Clippers. He's just dropping in, but he's great. But he's just, you know, he's not dominating everything. And so uh, that's where I, I think, you know, that's a long winded answer to your question. <laughs> No, no, it was beautiful. No, 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 no. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. Yeah, so I, I actually think with the three-point shot, I think the NBA has to keep an eye. This I might be wrong, but I think you got to keep an eye on the game because if the game becomes all paint shots and three-pointers, I think that's a problem. I think sports are better when, they're, when they're, there's a variety and versatility. So in football, I don't want three yards in a cloud of dust. And I don't want the arena league. I want some passing and I want some running. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, in baseball now with analytics, it's a lot of either home run or strikeout. I don't want all homers or all strikeouts. I want homers and strikeouts, but I want stolen bases. I want manufacturing runs. I want some singles. You know, things that's variety. In basketball, like Mike D'Antoni. He don't. He wants paint shots, 
three pointers mm. or free throws. That's it. And I don't think that's best for basketball. I think it's best when you got some three pointers, some fast breaking, some post play, some mid range, and all that. And so if the game ultimately becomes all threes and layups, then I think they need to consider cutting off the three-point line at the free throw line extended. And so you wouldn't be able to stack five guys or four, four guys around the free throw, the three-point line. Mm-hmm. And so that would bring back post play. It would bring back mid-range play. And you still would have the three. Three-point. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> that was beautiful, man. Because here's the thing, and you, you guys, if you still play, and I'm I'm getting to the point where I'm pretty much not playing. No, no, no. Yeah, it's, I'm up there, but when you, like as athletic as these young kids are, like just just when I go just play open gym or something, I can still get mine doing old school stuff, going in the post, shooting mid range, you know, because all these dudes want to do is dribble, 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 and shoot threes. That's it. And they'll go and have a 10-footer and kick it out, you know, or beat you off the dribble and come back, you know, for the, you know. And so as flashy and as, you know, handles and the shots and all the range of jump shots and all that, I don't know. It's not more effective, you know, than, than playing the old way. It just look good. Right, right, right. <laughs> it looked like you handling it, but you really hurting your team. You handling it for 15, 20 seconds, you know? I, I call it the James Hart. <laughs> <laughs> and look, I say Harden, because a lot of people hate on Harden. Harden is great, man. I mean, the dude, because y'all, if you played ever, I have so much respect for him because of how, I know how hard it is to just one-on-one shake somebody up. That in a lot of cases is more athletic than you, than Harden, right? And he still can shake you up enough with his handle, his feints, his slights, his step back and all that to create space for that three or go by you. You know, like, he's a bad boy, but yeah, I mean, is that style going to win a championship? You know. We'll see. Thank you. Well, Chris, we appreciate you uh, coming on. I wanted to ask you, um, I know uh, we talked about this uh, with uh, Scoop Jackson, is uh, once the uh, NBA Finals is set, we would love to have you back uh, for something like a pregame final, you know, based on your schedule, you know, based on your schedule, and talk about the last two teams standing. Yeah, as long as I can work it into the schedule, you know, I'm, sure. I'm open for sure. Yeah. I appreciate that. I'm going to wrap it up with the last question. This, this is my new question I like to ask everybody. You kind of hinted on it earlier, but I, I still just want to ask you. What, what's your best perk by, you know, by having the position that you're in, the job that you've had? What's been one of your, like, your best perks by having the role that you've been in? Oh, there's a lot. I mean, you you, you know – Obviously, you get to go to all of the the big, you know, big events. You know, I've been to several NBA finals, all-star games, baseball all-star game, World Series. Um, so going to all those events is is awesome. That's one thing. Meeting, obviously, legendary athletes uh, is terrific. And even, even heroes that I grew up, you know, Dr. J, Magic Johnson, Kareem, like guys that I watched as a kid, having been able to meet them and, and get to know some of them. Um, and so that's a perk. And I think the, like now I don't do it as much, mm-hmm. um, but the travel has been great to, you know, I've, I've been to Kuwait in the Middle East. Wow. I've been to Africa, Senegal, Senegal, the country in Africa. I've been to Rome, uh, Spain, uh, Vancouver, Toronto, every major city in America. So that traveled all just covering basketball. So those experiences, man, you know, that's that's a great perk because travel 
really broadens your horizons and mm -hmm. gives you perspective. And, and obviously, you just have some great experiences. So I, I would say to travel at the height, because I don't, I don't travel as much anymore because I'm usually in studio for TV or radio. Sure. But that was always one of the, the great perks. Well, again, you know, we appreciate you for giving us your time, uh, blessing the whole Rap Life Sports. Um, everybody that's watching this episode, make sure y'all subscribe, hit that button so y'all aware. Um, this will be dropping soon. Again, thanks to the legendary Chris Broussard for being on. And uh, with that being said, everybody uh, from Rap Life Sports, be blessed and be fresh. Rap Life. All right, Thank fellas. You. All right, man. All Talk right, to man. you soon. Peace.